This video covers lecture notes 12, which is on conditional probability. So let's build up to that with an example that we already know. Uh, so let's say we were tossing three balls, ball one, ball two, ball three, into three different bins. Let's call them bin one, bin two, and bin three. Uh, these are three bins. And we're going to toss three balls into these three different bins. Uh, and suppose that there's an event A, which we're going to want to know the probability of in a second, that zero balls land in B1. And then let's suppose there's another event B, which says that zero balls land in bin 2. So it's fairly straightforward to calculate the probability of A happening. And uh, this is also equal to the probability of B happening because we know that neither A nor B is privileged over the other. And uh, having zero balls in one bin is, is, is essentially the same thing as zero balls ending up in another. So how would we calculate this? Uh, well, we should already know how to do this. There's a two-thirds chance that it doesn't end up in either one of the bins in the first one. Uh, two-thirds chance on the second one that it doesn't end up in that same bin and also again a two-third chance on the last one that it again doesn't end up in that very same bin. So having computed this we'll know the probability that zero balls end up in any given bin. So this comes out to 8 over 27. So this lets us know the chances that no balls end up in any given bin, bin 1, bin 2, or bin 3. Now let's suppose that we were asked a different question. Let's suppose we were asked the question What's the probability of A given B? For those of you that don't know this notation, that's just saying assume B to be true and then find the probability of A. So the way we go about solving this is by, by thinking, okay, so we've restricted ourselves to the elements in B, which we know is that zero balls land in B2, and we know that this is some subset of omega, which is the sample space, which is all the possible outcomes of tossing these three balls. So we first start by recognizing that we're restricted to B by having assumed that it was true. Now we want to know, all right, what elements are in B and are also in A, which is also a subset of the sample space. Uh, so there's a good way of writing this. Uh, it's, it's in set notation which is basically what elements are in the intersection of A and B. But this won't just be enough because this will just enumerate uh, all of the elements that are in this. We want to know what's the probability of this occurring. So we can say that the probability of A given B is going to be equal to the number of elements in A intersection B but we're going to divide that by the total number of elements in B as well because we started by assuming B and thus restricted ourselves to the elements that are in B and now we're asking the question how many of those elements are also in A? So let's think about this. We know how big B is because we know the probability of B occurring is 8 out of 27. We know the sample space is of size 27 so we know that there are 8 outcomes in which none of the balls end up in bin 2 and then how many outcomes are there in which none of the balls end up in bin 2 nor do they end up in bin 1 so just by thinking about it you can see that there's only one of them and that's the outcome in which all three of the balls land in bin 3 so you can see that now that we've assumed B the probability of A happening is actually gone down because 1 eighth is less than 8 over 27. So the assumption of B decreased the probability of A happening. Uh, now we actually haven't done this for the general case. We were able to say this because each of the elements in the sample space are equally likely to happen but actually a better way of writing this would have been to say the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of the intersection of A and B divided by the probability 
of B. Uh, now, the probability of in the intersection between A and B is basically asking, what's the probability that uh, the ball neither lands in, that out of the three balls, none of them land in bin 1, and none of them land in bin 2, and this we know to be 1 over 27. And the probability of B we calculated right above, and that's 8 over 27, and that gives us the same answer. Now in this case, the probability uh, of there being no balls in bin 1 was greatly reduced by the fact that we assumed that there were also no balls in bin 2. So that's why probability of A given B was significantly lower than the probability of A. But uh, as we'll see, this won't always be the case. And let me just give you a couple trivial examples where it's obviously not the case. So first let's think about what is the probability of A given A. Well, it's obvious that this is equal to 1 because if you assume A, then the probability of A is 100%. Another example is uh, what is the probability that you roll a 6 given that your previous roll was equal to 4? Uh, well, your previous roll being 4 doesn't really affect this the probability of this roll being a 6, so this is really just the probability that you roll a 6, which is 1 over 6. So these are two trivial cases in which uh, one, one event didn't actually affect the probability of the other, and we'll talk about this second one a little bit more later. So now let's tackle a new question. Let's assume that you're Batman, and the world has been overrun by zombies to the point where one out of 20 people are now zombies. That's 5%. Uh, and as Batman, you have developed this awesome new zombie detector, and you want to know how good it is. So we know uh, a few of, so the specs basically of this zombie detector as, is that when you test uh, zombies, uh, ninety percent of the time, it'll detect them positively as zombies, and 10% of the time, it'll say that they're not zombies. And when you test this detector when humans are near, uh, there will be 20% false positives where it says they're a zombie and they're not, and it'll be 80% accurate that they are not zombies. Uh, so... This seems like a pretty good test uh, on the surface, but let's look a little deeper into what this test uh, is, is all about. So let's assume that we're asked the question, uh, if a random person is tested, uh, and that test is positive, So we're going to say that this is our B, and we're probably later going to ask what is the probability of some A given B, right? Uh, and what now we want to know is what is the probability that this was actually a zombie. So that... Uh, that they were actually a zombie is A, and what we're being asked here is what is the probability of A given B. So how we're going to solve this is we're going to look at the probability space of the problem in and of itself. So there are four possible outcomes to, uh, to administering the test. Uh, the first one is a true positive. That's where the test comes up positive, and uh, this is actually a zombie that you were testing. So uh, we know from uh, from the stats, the spec of this uh, this detector, that there's a 90% chance that if it is a zombie, 
that it comes out positive, and we also know that 1 in 20 people is a zombie, so the likelihood of this happening is 9 out of 200. Okay, uh, what else is in the probability space? There's also that it's a false positive. So we know that it uh, turns up positive incorrectly 20% of the time. So if you test a human and it still turns up positive. And we know that 19 out of 20 beings running around are humans. So this is going to give us 38 out of 200. So if you tested 200 people, 9 of them would be true positives. 38 would them, of them would be expected to be false positives. Then let's see how many true negatives we would get. Well, we know that this test is also 80% accurate on humans. So uh, you have 80% chance of, of, of being correct when you're testing a human. And we also know that 19 out of 20 people, 20 beings, are human. So this gives us 152 out of 200. And then the last option is a false negative where we say that uh, okay only one out of the ten uh, one out of ten tries sh tells you falsely that it's not a zombie uh, and then we know that one out of twenty people is a zombie so if we did this test two hundred times we would only expect that we'd get one false negative out of those two hundred so this has given us the probability space. This gives us a lot more information. And if you add these up, you see they add up to 200 out of 200, which is 1. So if you recall from earlier, uh, the way that we want to go about calculating the probability of A given B is we say, what's the probability of the intersection between A and B, which essentially can be thought of as A and B, uh, divided by the probability of B. So here, let, let's just write that out. We, we know that P of A given B is going to be equal to the probability of the intersection between A and B divided by the probability of B. So this is basically saying, what the top of this equation is saying at least, is it's asking, what's the probability that this, person, uh, this person's test came up positive and they were actually a zombie. Now notice that this is different than the, what the actual problem is asking, which is what's the probability that given that this test was positive that they were actually a zombie, this is saying what's the probability that this test was positive and it was actually a zombie. So you can see that they'd be related but they're not asking the exact same thing. In fact what this is asking is what's the, uh, what's the probability that you get a true positive, that, that this person was a zombie and the, the test came out positive. So we just calculated that to be 9 out of 200. Now what the bottom part of this equation is saying is what's the probability that your test came out positive in the first place? Well that's going to be uh, both the probability of a false positive and the probability of a true positive. That's going to be 9 out of 200 plus 38 out of 200. So this actually gives us a probability of 9 out of 47, which comes out to a probability of 0 0.19. So now the test isn't actually seeming as good as it, as it first did, because if a random person is tested and it comes up positive, the probability that that person is actually a zombie is only 0 0.19. So in this case, Probability has actually been used to obfuscate the truth that this is not so good of a test. Now, the, the data that we were given was that the probability of B given A, the probability that if uh, this person is a zombie, that the test will come up positive, is 0 0.9, which displays the test in a very positive light. So let's now actually look at one last metric, which uh, will tell us how good the test is. Uh, and let's look at what's the probability that the test is actually correct. So this is going to be these two cases where you have a true. So true positives and true negatives. That gives us 9 out of 200 plus 152 
out of 200, which is equal to 163 out of 200, which is approximately equal to 81.5%. So now using this test, we can be sure that it's 81.5% of the time that it'll give us uh, the correct answer as to whether we're looking at a zombie or a human. But let's look at another metric where you just assume that everyone is a human. So what's the probability of being correct if you assume all humans? And the probability of being correct because 95% of people are still humans is 95%. So in that light, this 81.5% doesn't actually seem quite that good, and realistically, Batman is probably not going to be using this device, because it's not all that. So let's keep it moving. Uh, now, I, I want to give us some new tools to solve problems like this. So I'm going to introduce something called Bayes Rule, which is quite powerful in a variety of different fields. And what Bayes Rule says is that the probability of A given B is equal to uh, this part you should have seen before the probability of A intersection with B over the probability of B and at this point this should intuitively make sense by now if not you should probably go back uh, and it's just saying that the probability of A given B is uh, you've assumed B is happening and then you say alright what's the probability that A and B are both happening uh, divided by the probability that B is happening because we already are assuming that B is taking place. Uh, so the next uh, little jump we're going to make is that this is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A over the probability of B. And all we've done is we've transformed this top expression to something that looks a little different. And this will uh, come to know as the product rule, and we'll discuss it quite a bit uh, a little later in the video. But uh, to get some intuition about this, basically this is saying that the probability of A and B is just the probability of A uh, multiplied by the probability of B given A. So th this should make a little bit of sense just, just listening to that sentence. Uh, and the reason that we've expressed it this way, we could equally express it as the probability of A given B times the probability of B, but we're what we're actually searching for is the probability of A given B. And this is really nice because it allows us to express something that might be difficult, which is what's the probability of A given B in terms of something that's less difficult, which is what's the probability of B given A. Uh, and as you can see in the above example, what we were asked is what's the probability of A given B What's the probability that someone is actually a zombie if they test positive? And what we know uh, is what's the probability of B given A? What's the probability that uh, if the test is positive that this person is actually a zombie? Because we're given that in the spec and in the problem statement. So a lot of the times we'll be given uh, in the problem statement B given A, but want to find A given B. So now we can express them in terms of one another, and that's really great. And uh, uh, cool, uh, let, let's actually solve the previous problem in terms of this. We saw that the probability of B given A, the probability that someone uh, is a zombie if they test positive, is 0 0.9. Sorry, someone uh, tests positive if they're a zombie, that's B given A, uh, times the probability of A, which is uh, the probability that someone actually is a zombie, which is uh, 0 0.05. Uh, this divided by the probability of B. Uh, now the probability of B is that uh, someone tests positive at all and let's look back to what we came up with. Uh, there's uh, either true positives or false positives and this is 38 by 200 plus 9 by 200 which is 47 by 200. And you'll notice that this is actually the same expression that uh, we computed uh, over here to figure out how good this test was because this is 9 by 10 times 1 by 20, that's 9 by 200, and then we'll get the same answer, which is 9 by 200, uh, 9 by 47. And you see we got this result with significantly less work. 
Uh, I'm going to introduce something else now, which is called uh, to the total probability rule. So total probability. And what this is saying is that the probability of B is equal to the probability of A and B, which where this is any A, uh, plus the probability of A's complement and B, which is the same from uh, this product rule that we that we can see above, as saying probability of B given A times the probability of A. The probability of B given A's complement times the probability of A complement. Uh, we haven't actually introduced what a complement is, but it's pretty straightforward. Basically, A complement is a subset of omega such that uh, any A which is part of A complement uh, is not a member of A. Basically, just not A. Or the set of things that is orthogonal to A and shares no elements with A. So uh, let's actually calculate uh, the probability of the B that we were given above uh, from the earlier example with zombies. And that probability of B can be expressed as the probability of B given A which let's look at that again, the probability that the test is positive given uh, that this person is actually a zombie. Again, it's from the problem statement. We know that. That's uh, 0 0.9 times the probability of A. That's that the person is actually a zombie. And that is uh, 0 0.05 plus the probability of B given A complement, which is that uh, this uh, test came up positive even though the person was a human, that's, uh, that person was not a zombie, A complement, that's just not A effectively. Um, and we know that there are only 20% false positives, so this is 0 0.2 uh, multiplied by how many humans there are, or uh, the prob multiplied by the probability of A complement, which is what's the probability of it being a human, which is 0 0.95, and this actually gives us that same figure, 47 over 200. So I want to stress here that we haven't done really anything new. Uh, we've just kind of made explicit things that we've been doing uh, throughout the whole videos and even uh, the whole video and even a little bit what we did in earlier videos. So uh, using these two equations, we've actually come up with a way to sort of blindly calculate things without really thinking too much about it. If you plug this total probability equation in for probability of B in Bayes' rule, you just get that the probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B given A times the probability of A plus the probability of B given A complement uh, times the probability of A complement. And again, I got that just by plugging in uh, probability of B into Bayes' rule. So let's look at uh, some correct applications of Bayes' rule, just one in fact just to make sure that we get the gist of it. And the idea is that using Bay Bayes' rule, we can actually just plug and chug like idiots. So suppose we're given the problem where we have two bins with some marbles in them. Uh, some of them are purple, some of them are black. And given that we picked a purple marble, we want to know what's the probability that we picked from bin one. Uh, and uh, I've written out what A, uh, B, and A complement are because we're going to need them when we plug and chug. But basically it's saying what's the probability of A given B? What's the probability we picked from bin 1 given that we picked a purple marble? Uh, and here A complement is that we picked uh, from bin 2. So proper application of Bayes' rule is basically just going to say that the probability of this is equal to the probability of B given A uh, multiplied by the probability of A divided by the probability of B given A times the probability of A again. So we will only have to do half as much work because we'll get two things out of it. Um, multiplied by the probability of B given A complement 
times the probability of a complement. Now I want to emphasize just how ridiculously easy it is once we get it into this form and it's pretty clear to see that the probability of B given A that we picked a purple marble uh, assuming we were picking from bin 1 is 2 out of 5 times the probability that we pick from bin 1 is 1 out of 2 divided by 2 out of 5 times 1 out of 2 plus the probability that we picked a purple marble given that we picked from bin 2 is 1 out of 2 and the probability that we chose bin 2 assuming we chose fairly is also 1 out of 2 so we can cancel these 1 out of 2's and easily get the answer 4 out of 9 uh, that was that was really really easy and it just shows that this is a that that base rule just allows you to plug stuff in and it pops out real nice so now we're gonna move on to define a few things but I want you to keep base rule in the back of your head as we do this because they're very related to the things we're talking about so I'm gonna define the first thing uh, is independent events which I hinted at earlier but formally it's saying that two events A and B are independent if the probability of A and B is just equal to the probability of A times the probability of B or rather a more intuitive way of stating this is that the probability of A given B is equal to using the fact above as well as Bayer's rule will say this is the probability of A intersected with B or the probability of B but we know that this is just equal to the probability of A times the probability of B over probability of B which is equal to probability of A so it's just saying basically that A and B are completely independent uh, being given A doesn't really affect whether or not uh, being given B isn't, doesn't really affect whether or not A is going to happen and you should be able to see on your own how this uh, this notion generalizes is to a set of events A1 to AN and how they can be what's known as mutually independent but we're going to move on from that and we're going to define something new which is the product rule and I talked about that before uh, but we're just going to formally define it and prove it right here and that's just saying that the probability of A intersection with B probability of A and B is equal to the probability of B given A multiplied by the probability of A now I tried some give, give, to give some intuition for that earlier but here we're actually going to prove it. We're actually going to prove something more general than that. More generally, we can say that the probability of i equals 1 to n. So the intersection between all the a sub i's between i equals 1 to n is equal to the probability of a sub 1 times the probability of a sub 2 given a sub 1 times the probability of a sub 3 given a sub 1 and a sub 2 times the probability of a sub n given the intersection between or sorry 1 and n minus 1 of all the a sub i's. So we're going to prove this fact by induction uh, and it's going to give us a really really powerful result. So let's prove the base case which is event essentially the first statement. Uh, that is the probability of a intersection with b is equal to the probability of B intersected of B given A times the probability of A and we should be con comfortable manipulating these kinds of things by now uh, comfortable enough to say that we know this is equal to uh, the probability of B and A divided by the probability of A times the probability of A which is just the equal to 
the probability of B's intersection with A. And what we did here is we just converted this to this, which is a formula we know from earlier and intuition we have from earlier. And then this falls out nice and clean. So this uh, effectively serves as our base case. Now our inductive hypothesis is that the probability of i equals 1 to n minus 1, this is saying the intersection between the a sub i's between 1 to n minus, minus 1 is equal to the probability of a1 times the probability of a2 given a1 times all the way up until the probability of a n minus 1 given i equals 1 to n minus 2 of a i. Okay, so this is our inductive hypothesis. We assume this. Now in our inductive step, we want to find what the probability of the intersection between these a sub i's all the way to n, sorry, is going to be. Uh, and we can actually break that down into the probability of a sub n intersected with uh, i equals 1 to n minus 1, a sub i. And essentially using the same definition of uh, probability that we used in the base case, we can say that this is equal to the probability of a sub n given i equals 1 to n minus 1 a sub i. So you see what we did here? This we wanted to know what's the probability of a sub n intersected with uh, the intersection of all these sets, uh, which is basically uh, a sub n is just a, the intersection of all these sets is b, and we're using the base case to uh, to break this down into b given a, which is um, this, and times the probability of a, and stuff. So we can get this times uh, probability of a sub 1, and now we're just going to basically be rewriting this portion of the expression times dot 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 times probability of a sub n minus 1 dot go away given uh, i equals 1 to n minus 2 of a sub i. So with that, our proof of this is complete. And let's think about some of the implications of this. Uh, we can actually rethink all of the probability we've been doing so far and sort of reframe it in terms of conditional probability. So let's look at a particular problem, which is the probability of getting a flush uh, when dealt a five card hand. Um, so uh, out of 52 cards. So before the way that we looked at it, uh, so what we did before was we thought, okay, so there's four different suits it could be. So that's four choose one multiplied by, if you get that suit, there's 13 cards in a suit and there's five different ways that you can pick from them, choose from them to uh, get all the different uh, possible flushes in a given hand, in a given suit. Uh, so these are all the, the number, this is the total number of flushes, and we're dividing it by 52 choose 5, which is the total number of ways that you can be dealt cards, which comes out to 4 times 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 over 52 times 51 times 50 times 48, 49 times 48. So that's the way that we approached it before, but now let's approach it in terms of conditional probability. So we still need to break it up into four different cases where uh, there's four different suits where you can get flushes, but let's look at the probability of getting uh, a flush of diamonds which uh, let's think about this again we're thinking about it in terms of conditional probability so uh, this can be thought of 
as the intersection between a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, and a 5 where uh, a 5 where a i represents getting a di getting a diamond on the ith draw so uh, this can basically be represented as 4 times the probability of getting a diamond on the first card multiplied by the probability of getting a diamond given that you have one diamond already um, multiplied by the probability of getting a diamond given that the first and the second card were both diamonds multiplied by the probability of getting a diamond given that the first second third were all diamonds multiplied by the probability diamond you get the point four and multiplied uh, yeah right there so this is the last one so uh, a way of thinking about this is this is four times the probability of getting a diamond on the first card is 13 out of 52 probability of getting a diamond given that you have just drawn a diamond is uh, 12 out of 51 uh, again it becomes 11 out of 50 and then 10 out of 49 and then 9 out of 48 and if you notice this expression is the same as the one that we got over there it's just that we got it by looking at conditional probability rather than by counting now there's one last concept from the notes that I want to illustrate and I hope it have, I haven't lost you yet because this is actually somewhat of a difficult concept and uh, it's known as the principle of inclusion and exclusion and I'm going to illustrate it by uh, through an example so uh, this is the example where you pick a number between one and six you roll three die and you win if one of the die is your number so uh, let's break this down and say that uh, we want a one is uh, that your first die uh, comes out to the first die comes out to the number a two is that the second die comes out to your number and a three is that the third die comes out to your number right so let's say we want to know that the pro what the probability of you winning is so um, first let's say is it going to be equal to the probability of a one plus the probability of a two plus the probability of a three and the answer is no, because this would be 1 6 plus 1 6 plus 1 6 equals 3 over 6. And this is wrong, uh, because let's generalize this. Let's imagine you rolled 6 die, right? Then it would just be uh, 1 over 6 times 6, which is 6 over 6. And it, there, it isn't 100% chance that you win. So this is clearly uh, an incorrect approach towards solving this problem. And the reason is that A1, A2, and A3 are not disjoint sets. They have some elements in common. For example, if all three die come out to your number, or A1 and A2 are, uh, both come out to your number. So we should actually look at A1, A2, and A3 as a Venn diagram in which they have some overlapping elements. And effectively what we want to know is what's the probability of A1 or a2 or a3 which is saying what's the probability of the union of these three sets so uh, it's actually solving this uh, you'll realize that this part will come in handy we'll say okay it's the probability of a1 plus the probability of a2 plus the probability of a3 but now you'll see what we've done is we've counted this part once this part once, this part once, this has been double counted, this has been double counted, this has been double counted, and this has actually been triple counted. So uh, we need to make up for that and make sure that we only count everything once. So next what we're going to do is we're going to subtract the intersection between a1 
and A2, and then also subtract the intersection between A1 and A3, and subtract the intersection between A2 and A3. And now we'll find that we've counted this once, this once, and this once, but we've counted this zero times. So now we have to make up for that. So at the, in the end, we add the probability of A1 and A2 and A3, or rather the union between these three sets. So this gets crossed out, and now we've counted this one. Now we've counted this once. So now we're happy, right? So, but we, th this, is, this is for three elements. Now you're going to have to take my word for it as we scale this same process up to uh, higher orders uh, in dealing with, higher, uh, with more elements. We'll get this equation that I have written here, which is a process of converging uh, to calculating the right probability of the union of some set. So the first part is this is corresponds to this right here, which is the summing of the probabilities of each of the elements occurring individually. And that's an overestimation because you saw we got double counting in their intersection. And then you subtract the intersections, uh, but then you've now underestimated because you haven't counted certain areas. And then basically, uh, then this term will, con will uh, correspond to this. And basically, you're converging to the correct solution, where this ij and ijk are all possible pairings or all possible triplets of, of these sets a sub i's. Uh, and again, the reason why this problem arose in the first place is that these sets are not disjoint, and they have overlapping uh, territory. So you can't just add up the probabilities of each of them. Uh, so this video got a little bit long, but that's because the lecture notes themselves are, are quite long. Uh, and uh, thanks for thanks for listening.